Now, if you're getting too hot, the first thing that happens is you get the peripheral vasodilation. But if that's not enough, the body will then go on to produce sweat. So, for example, if you're exercising, you're running along, you're producing a lot of heat, you start sweating to cool yourself down. So sweating is a thermoregulatory mechanism that goes beyond the vasodilation. It's an additional mechanism. And it's used as a second mechanism because, of course, it involves water loss, whereas the vasodilation doesn't. So the body is actually very sensible and efficient, and efficient in the order in which it tries to cool the body down if it's getting too hot. So let's think about the surface of the skin again. And we're going to have sweat glands. And the sweat glands dip right down, and they are coiled tubes deep in the dermis. It's a coiled tube. This is the boundary between the epidermis and the dermis. Here's the hypodermis here. Sweat glands are usually quite deep down in the, in the dermis. And there's two components to it. There's the glandular component and there's the sweat gland duct. And the glandular component is associated with small blood vessels. So there's an arteriole, capillaries surrounding the glandular component and a venule. And sweat is actually taken from the plasma. So the water and the other components in sweat come from the plasma into the sweat gland component here, into the gland itself, the glandular component. Then when the sweat has been formed, it will move up the sweat gland duct all the way through the dermis, through the epidermis, and it will be deposited on the surface of the body. And on the surface of the body, the sweat will evaporate. Now, there's physics involved here, because for water to evaporate, it takes an awful lot of energy. It's called the latent heat of vaporization. So the sweat's deposited on the surface of the body. It takes a lot of energy to evaporate that sweat, for it to evaporate away. That is the latent heat of vaporization. And that latent heat is extracted from the surface of the body to evaporate the sweat. So as the sweat evaporates, a great deal of heat is lost from the body. And if you're in a very hot environment, as long as you keep drinking, and as long as you can keep sweating, and as long as that sweat can evaporate, you can maintain a physiological body temperature, even in really quite extreme environments. The problem comes in hot environments if you can't sweat or the sweat cannot evaporate. So if someone's so dehydrated they can't make sweat, the body temperature can start to rise and they can get life-threatening hyperthermia. Or if they're wearing clothes and the sweat can't evaporate through the clothes, again, they can get life-threatening hyperthermia. But as long as the sweat can evaporate, we can normally maintain a reasonable physiological body temperature. So the sweat is produced in the glandular portion, rises up through the ductal portion to the surface of the body. Now, this type of sweat gland the thermoregulatory sweat gland is called an eccrine sweat gland. An eccrine sweat gland. So this is an eccrine sweat gland we've drawn here. And there's going to be three or four million of these all over the surface of the body, the eccrine sweat glands. And the proper name for sweat glands is the pseudoriferous glands. So what we've actually drawn here is an eccrine pseudoriferous gland, an eccrine pseudoriferous gland. We normally just call it a sweat gland. And this sweat is going to contain water, obviously. And I'm sure you've tasted sweat, it tastes salty, because there's sodium and chloride in the plasma, and they go into the sweat. And in fact, the composition of sweat does somewhat mirror 
the composition of the plasma. So there can be some urea and uric acid in the sweat as well. And in fact, when patients are very uremic, if you're looking after uremic patients with kidney failure, the sweat is going to contain a lot of urea. A lot of urea is deposited on the surface of the body and the patients can get what's called a urea frost. They can get like white powdery urea on the surface of the body, but that would be very severe uremia. But the sweat is reflecting the composition of the plasma. So the sweat's going to contain water, sodium chloride, which is salt, urea and some waste ure ureic acid. But it also contains useful things like glucose and amino acids, but again, only in very small amounts. And it's important to realise that even although some of these waste products are lost in sweat, the sweat glands are not homeostatic. They're not regulating the amount of material that's lost in the sweat to maintain the internal environment of the body. They're just thermoregulatory. Of course, the homeostatic organs are the kidneys, but the sweat glands aren't doing that. That's the job of the kidneys. So these are the eccrine pseudoriferous glands. But there's another type of sweat gland called an apocrine sweat gland. An apocrine sweat gland, it's a much bigger gland. So again, it's a, it's a coiled tube, but it's a much bigger, much bigger gland. It's a coiled, large, glandular tube. And very often these apocrine sweat glands actually open into hair follicles and the sweat leaves via a hair follicle. Here's a hair in this one. So this is the hair in here. This is the hair follicle and this is an apocrine sweat gland opening into the hair follicle. So when apocrine sweat is produced, it's produced in the glandular portion of the apocrine gland, just as it was in the eccrine pseudoriferous gland. The sweat goes into the hair follicle and the sweat goes onto the surface of the body via the hair follicle. I've drawn my follicle a bit long there, it only goes to the surface of the body obviously. So the sweat goes up here and onto the, onto the surface. Now the apocrine sweat glands are stimulated by hormonal changes at the time of puberty. So children do not produce apocrine sweat. It started to be produced at puberty and it's produced throughout adult life. And the Apocrine sweat glands are primarily in the axilla, in the armpit, and round about the groin. Now having said that, there are some apocrine sweat glands in the bearded portion of a man's face and in the areola area around a woman's nipple. The areola is the coloured area around about the nipple. But most of the apocrine sweat glands are in the axilla and in the groin. And they don't work in children they just start working in puberty, but then they carry on working through adult life. And as well as containing water, apocrine sweat also contains some lipids and some proteins. It's thicker sweat and it contains lipids and it contains proteins. And the combination of the water and the lipids and the proteins from the apocrine sweat glands does not smell. It doesn't smell. But very quickly, the lipids and the proteins secreted onto the surface of the body in the apocrine sweat are acted on by bacteria on the surface of the body. So the bacteria metabolize the lipids in the apocrine sweat, they metabolize the proteins in the apocrine sweat, and the bacteria start producing waste products. And these waste products are very smelly. That's why unwashed armpits and unwashed groins become smelly because of the apocrine sweat and the bacterial action on that apocrine sweat. So eccrine sweat glands are, sweat glands are thermoregulatory. Apocrine, apocrine sweat glands 
producing this apocrine sweat. And this gives people a kind of a characteristic smell. And some people say that there's pheromones in it. It's kind of a way that you can recognise people or even potentially, some people say, be attracted. You know, when you talk about the chemistry being right between two people, that's probably what you're talking about, that the smell of the bacterial breakdown products on their apocrine sweat is somehow consistent with your nasal cavity and your brain.